All right. Good morning, Facebook. Good morning, class. Once again, it's Thursday. Another group of students here. I've got 11. Got a few of them looking for jobs. So employers out there, give us a call, 239-936-7044. I'll put you in contact with um, potential officers here. Today we're going to go over 493, the first segment of the uh, class. This is pertinent to everything that we do. 493 is our Bible. The 493 statutes govern everything the security industry does. All right. The Department of Agriculture is the agency behind the legislation. They're the ones that do all the enforcement out there. Um, Bob Henderson and Investigator Bob Van Cleek, great guys, by the way. Um, anyway, so what are the classes of licenses? Well, to run unarmed security, you need a D license. Right. When you want to work armed security, you need a G license. You also need to have your D license present with you as well. All right. If you want to teach, you need a DI license. If you want to teach unarmed security, if you want to teach armed security, you need a K license. All right. We talked about the different classes of licenses last week. Um, in order to work for a security agency, a security agency has to have a B license in order to operate. Insurance requirements, so on and so forth. Um, same for the armed security aspect of it. If you want to run a school, a DS license. This is a DS school. I think it's like nine nine triple zero one three or something like that. I don't remember. Anyway, um, what can you do? Well, it depends on the client. Ultimately, the client is the one that holds the ultimate power. It depends on your client's needs. Depends on the company's guidelines, all right, and then also have to coincide with Chapter 493, all right. So we talk about use of force, we talk about different techniques involved with that, um, and what type of intermediate and incapacitating weapons that unarmed security officers can carry. As an unarmed security officer, you can carry everything all the way up until and before the firearm. So a taser, baton, pepper spray, handcuffs billy clubs, things like that, that is authorized. Now, I wouldn't recommend going out there and just, just because you can wear it, getting it, because if you hit somebody with a baton or spray somebody in the face with pepper spray and it goes to court and you were never taught how to use it or you handcuff someone who wound up not committing a crime, guess what, that's kidnapping, it's a federal crime, all right? you need to know the proper techniques behind all of that. And your company policy is going to tell you whether or not you can carry those weapons. All right. So, you know, pepper spray. Who here would say you pepper spray someone in the face? All right. How about pepper spraying somebody in the eyes? No. The truth is, is you never, pe you never pepper spray someone directly in the eyes. You go for the eyebrow. You actually go for this part of the forehead. The mist will actually hit the eyes. If you hit the eyes directly, if you're too close, all right, if you're inside of that, you know, let's just say within a foot of someone, if we spray right here, the propellant will take the pepper spray and push it behind the eye. And the only way to clean that out is to quite literally pop the eyeball out of the socket that's called needling. So if you wound up using pepper spray and you did that to someone and you were never formally trained on it, you're the one that assumes all of the liability. Right? That's why we say get trained on it. Some companies out there offer training for it. Some internal companies will also train you themselves. Go to work next door at the mall, handcuffing. They teach you you have to go through a handcuffing class before you can handcuff someone. It's just like in law enforcement. You, before you can go right out of UTC, um, a uniform traffic citation, you have to be trained in the 316 statutes on traffic law. You also need to be trained on how to do a motor vehicle stop, how to have probable cause, a PC for the stop, the whole nine yards. There's a lot of training that goes behind everything. So just because you come out of the academy doesn't mean that you can go out right away and arrest a bad guy. You have to go through your field training. You have to demonstrate proficiency with this and get trained properly. It's kind of what this is. A lot of people would say, you know, that their background would exclude them from having to take this. I have military personnel that do it all the time. 
law enforcement? Well, I took this class because law enforcement in the state of Florida is governed by Florida Statute 943. Their use of force guidelines are different than security's use of force guidelines. Right? They have a duty to act. Us as security, we do not. Right? And the 493 being the governing body tells us what we need, All right, which is what we're going to talk about now. In order to work on armed security, like I said, you need a D license, right? Your D license <clears throat> your green top. That is your class D unarmed security license. Alright? In order to work armed security, I told you you need a G license and the D license. You cannot obtain a G license without it first having the D license, all right? And when you're working armed security, both licenses have to be in your possession at all times. Guys, we have it easy because we've got wallets. Ladies, a little harder just because of the purse thing. Because it has to be in your physical possession. It can't be remotely around you, laying in the car or somewhere on post. It has to be on your immediate persons. Now, as a DI, for the instructor, I have my yellow card, my DI license. So while I'm teaching, this needs to be in my possession at all times. The other thing that you need to have in your possession at all times is going to be your agency identification card. Every agency out there will issue you an ID card. All right? You need to have your company ID card, your D license if you're doing unarmed security, and your D and G license both with the agency ID if you're doing armed security. They have to be in your immediate possession. All right? Now, uniform guidelines, you need to be able to be identified as a security officer from at least 15 feet away, which, which is what we like to say. All right? So while we're doing that, the other thing you need to have is something on your uniform that identifies the agency you're working for. Right there. Got it, right? Now, I have a another shirt inside of there that has the security on it and everything like that. Um, words you can't use. Now, who would assume... Can you wear this shirt? No. Yes, you can. There's nothing against you wearing a t-shirt. Nothing wrong with that. There's the band called The Police. They had shirts that looked like this, right? Now, the reason you can is just because it's a shirt, freedom of speech, right? I can go out to any store and buy a shirt that says security on it. A lot of people used to wear them just because they could. They're not impersonating security, though. They're just wearing a t-shirt, right? Same for that, where it says police on it. Now, the second you start telling someone to do something, or you put a badge on your waist or around your neck or something, that's an attempt to deceive the common person into believing that you're a law enforcement officer. It's a crime to impersonate a law enforcement officer. It's the same crime to impersonate a security officer. Because we are licensed and regulated by the state, we have a professional license, we are regulated, it does become a crime to impersonate security. And to believe it or not, it does happen. To do unlicensed security work, all right, let's say that you don't have you're not working for a security agency and you're like you know what I can do this on my own I'm gonna go out here and work at a nightclub I'm gonna be security at the nightclub right and they pay you cash all right and they say cool you're good to go you get hurt work comp isn't covering you and you have no insurance you are doing unlicensed security work you're not in-house all right if you were in-house eh, good to go in-house means that you're getting paid, you're on, workers, you're on their workers' compensation, and you're covered by their insurance. An agency has to have, obviously, workers' comp, and they need to have insurance to cover any incidents that can happen. So if you wind up working as a doorman and a lot of other stuff, you're on your own. Not only that, it's a hefty fine by the Department of Agriculture for doing unlicensed security work. You, know, you can't work as private bodyguard for somebody unless they are specifically paying you to work for them and not 1099, but actually working for that 
person covered by their work comp, their insurance. All right, see how that's going to work? If you don't have that insurance and workers' compensation coverage to cover yourself, it becomes illegal. Anyway, <clears throat> things you're not allowed to wear while acting as security. Obviously, that shirt says police. So if you were working as a security detail somewhere and you wore a shirt that said police on it, I'm pretty sure that's impersonating a law enforcement officer. Okay? So words you're not allowed to use, it's actually in your handout there. Um, the second page, if you flip that over. Um, actually, I believe it's the third page. I apologize. third page is your, um, the one I'm talking about. So the second page is defensive tactics, use of force, response and resistance matrix. Now, uniform regulations, I told you about the security thing and being visible from 15 feet away. You are not allowed to use deputy, marshal, constable, sheriff, agent, police, or any other markings that would confuse the general public in believing that you are more than just a security guard or a security officer. Now, things you're also not allowed to use. On company vehicles, all right, an agency-owned patrol car. The colors for the lights on top or inside of the vehicle, whatever, need to be green and amber, or all amber. So, and the green and amber is 50-50. 50, 50. 50 green, 50 amber. You cannot use red and blue, you can't use blue, you can't use red, you can't use purple, all right? Red, red and white, is reserved for fire and rescue. Blue, blue and white, and then blue and red, is reserved specifically for law enforcement. It depends on actually where you're from, because up north, it's actually blue is for um, the volunteer firefighters and red is for law enforcement gets training. Anyway, purple is for funeral processions. All right, those of those who are guiding people through funerals and everything like that, they've got purple lights. All right, it's specifically designated for that. Ours is green and yellow or straight yellow. Now, other things you're not allowed to do. Use of the seal of the great state of Florida. All right, I'll show you the differences between the different seals and everything. You cannot use that on badges. You can't use it on the, um, your agency ID cards or company ID cards. You can't use them on any solicitation or material. You can't even use them on your vehicles. You can't use the state seal at all for any reason whatsoever. It doesn't matter. You can't use it. It's actually proprietary. Even some law enforcement agencies are not allowed to use it. They have to petition the state and get the rights to use the seal. All right? Now, the other thing you're not allowed to have is a five-pointed star all right, for badges. Even as an emblem on a business card, as an emblem on a vehicle, no five-point stars. They are owned and proprietary to the Florida Sheriff's Association. That's why only deputies and sheriffs have a five-pointed star badge, all right? That also includes their little investigators and 10-year service and all the other badges with a little wreath around it, all right? And this badge right here, even though technically it's circle, it's a five-pointed star. Henry County Sheriff's Department actually uses a badge similar to this. So five-point stars, no-go. Now I'll show you, the, show you the state seals. No. Uh -uh. I'll show you the state seals in a few moments. All right. So, recap: nothing identifying you as anything other than security, and have to be in possession of all your licenses. If you do not have any one of your licenses in your possession, it is a fine. Whether it's your agency ID card. Your D license, your DNG license for armed, for armed security work, it's a fine. If you're not in uniform, it's a fine. Right. Now, if you have a concealed weapons permit, you cannot carry a concealed weapon while working on armed security. Armed security is a little different. You have to gain, you have to let the agency, the Department of Agriculture know, and it's only on a limited basis for armed security, but you don't need to concern yourself with that. The Concealed, what I'm talking about is let's say that I have a security uniform on and I put my gun on and I cover it up with my shirt, my uniform shirt, 
You are in uniform. You are in your security uniform. You are concealing a weapon. It is a crime. Even though you may have a concealed carry license, in accordance with 493, you are an unarmed security officer. You are not authorized to carry a concealed weapon, and you have not let the Department of Agriculture know. It's a fire. All right. Also, having a firearm in your vehicle. Now, driving to and from work, no problem. All right. Guns in your glove box, whatever. Center console, wherever, as long as it's encased, you know, locked box, whatever, holster, cannot be readily accessible. Well, once you get on post, if you park your vehicle, gun stays there. You get out, lock it up, and go to work. You're in your gatehouse. Good to go. However, if they ask you for some reason to drive your personal vehicle around and your firearm is inside of your vehicle, you are an unarmed officer with direct access to a firearm that is a crime on both you and the agency. You are not allowed to have that firearm in the vehicle while driving. Technically, you're not doing armed security work. Technicality. All right. So the things that I was telling you about All right. You get your security badge. Five point of star. Five point star. And then the great seal. All right. That's what you guys are going to take a look at real quick. See the five point of star? Mm -hmm. Even the center seal from the five point of star for the sheriff's department is proprietary. So you'll never even be able to get that. The only way to actually get that center seal is to order the badge with that center seal or order this badge type. You can't change the seal at all. Actually, you already saw these, right? Now the next one, the most common state seal is the one inside of here. That's the great seal. Did that ever, the that's the great seal. seal. This is the seal that you're not allowed to use. The seal, the one in my right hand, or on your left in this case, is the most common center seal. And then the one inside my wallet is the great seal for the state of Florida. <coughs> right. You cannot use the great seal for anything. And even this seal is kind of a technicality when it comes to using it. All right, because that's the most widely used seal, the one in my right hand is the one that's most widely used. Even law enforcement agencies, like I said, have to petition to get that. Now, this is my security badge. I'm the supervisor, director of security. I just have a generic you know, $8.95 badge and had it ordered, sent over, no big deal. The seal, uh, the seal in the middle is the Liberty Seal. All right. So... For the most part, that's it in a nutshell. All right. If you fall asleep on post, you will be fined. It's negligence. If you wind up abandoning post, walking off the job, quitting your job, it's a crime. It's abandonment. You will be fined. You will be charged. Your licenses will be revoked. If you caught sleeping, your license will be revoked. You, you will receive a fine. Right? You cannot just quit your job. It's not like a normal job where it's just like, eh, the hell with this, I'm done. Screw it, I'm out. It doesn't work that way. You do that, you've left a post that's now unoccupied by an officer for protection, and you've screwed that company. So you're not just screwing your company, you're not sticking it to your boss, you're sticking it to the client as well. So that's why it's a crime, all right? You can be charged for it completely. You can be charged with negligence, dereliction of duty. You can also have everything stripped and taken away from you. Department of Agriculture can revoke every license that it issues. If you think it just becomes a thing with just your D&G license, think again. They can take your DI. They can take your agencies from you. They can take everything. They can suspend every license you own, including your conceal. Especially if you violate any of the firearms laws. It will automatically suspend your concealed carry permit. Right? 
is you're supposed to be the professional. You're supposed to know what you're doing with everything. Right? There's a lot more with it. We'll get into that as well. We talked about the uh, vehicles, what you can and can't use. You need something to identify the company that you work for, the agency license number, and the agency ID, and the phone number, yada, yada, yada. Right? We'll talk more about that in a minute. i got to wrap this up. So, I'm Mike with PSI. Um, come see us. We do class every Thursday through Sunday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Phone number is 239-936-7044. Check us out on the web, psifortmyers.com. Check us out on Facebook, Professional Security Institute, as well as YouTube under the same name. If you love your Second Amendment as much as I do and you like to hear Freedom Ring, especially in different calibers like 50 BMG or 20 BMG, good stuff like that, um, come see us at Tactical Weapons here, the Gun Negotiator. All right, we also do the Concealed Carry classes every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday at noon for $60. All right. I'm Mike, and as always, stay informed.